sorry that I was a little off my game. I didn't realize I, I'm, I'd had this cycle A, B, and C for the readings. I think I had the first, the wrong first readings. I apologize. In any event, there was a moment where a few religious came together to pray. It was a Benedictine monk, a Franciscan friar, a Dominican, and a Jesuit. Kind of an interreligious moment of prayer. And as they were praying, they were transported to the place of Bethlehem. And there they were beholding the Christ child in the manger. The Benedictine monk broke out into beautiful songs and chant and praising of God. The Franciscan fell on the ground in adoration of the humility of God. The Dominican began to expand about the incredible importance of the incarnation and theological uh, importance of this moment. And the Jesuit walked up to St. Joseph and said, Have you thought about the boy's education? (laughs) And can I get the phone number of the guy who brought the gold? (laughs) Again, probably a true story. (laughs) Today we celebrate the beautiful feast of the Holy Family. This beautiful reality that God entered into our world, but not just into our world, he entered into a family. He consecrates everything he touches. He makes everything holy. So when God enters the womb, life in the womb becomes holy, becomes sacred. Kind of like the story of King Midas. Everything King Midas touched turned to gold. Everything God touches becomes holy. When God was born of Our Lady, motherhood became holy. St. Joseph adopted him, and not only did adoption, but fatherhood became something holy, something sacred. When God worked with his hands in the carpenter's shop of Nazareth, human labor became holy. Even when God entered into suffering, suffering became holy. Even death itself became holy when God entered into death. And so the same too with human family. God enters into a human family, and that family becomes sacred, that family becomes holy. And so we call it the holy family because the center of that family is God himself, incarnate, as one of us among us. The holy family speaks about this family that's centered upon God himself. Now we may think of the beautiful imagery of the holy family and have a nice little vision of our mind of Mary and Joseph and Jesus standing there all glowing and think that somehow because it was the Holy Family, they had no sufferings. When in fact, the opposite is so true. You think about the fact that Jesus was born homeless. There was no place for him in the inn. I'm sure there was a bit of frustration on Joseph's part in the sense of not being able to provide anything better than a stable and could not provide a better crib than a manger filled with some fresh hay that he was able to gather. Every man knows the importance of providing for one's family, and here Joseph is incapable of providing. Again, he had a surrender to the will of God at this moment. This is the way God wanted it. But still, I'm sure his fatherly heart, his heart wanting to, wanted to give God the best of everything, must have been a bit frustrated in the fact that he wasn't able to. That Christ is born in such poverty. And even when the kings came and the magi did their adoration, there was a tint of the cross in the gifting of their gifts. Sure, the gold represented that Jesus is king, the king of kings and lord of lords. And the frankincense was to symbolize that this child is God himself, because we only offer incense to God. So to offer incense to the Christ child was to recognize him as God. But then we had that third king who brought myrrh, this bitter herb, which was a symbol of suffering. The symbol of suffering. Even at his birth, there was that shadow of the cross that was there. And even today's gospel, Jesus is 40 days old when they present him in the temple. And there's this beautiful moment of rejoicing as Simeon sings his beautiful Nunc Dimittis. Now, Master, let your servant go in peace. And then he hands Jesus back to Mary and says, 
This child is destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel to be a sign that will be contradicted and you yourself, a sword, will, be, will pierce. I always kind of picture this and everybody kind of look at Simeon going like, who invited you? <laughs> like this, this moment of you know, prophecy of the suffering of Christ. Once again, that shadow of the cross over this joyful mystery of the rosary that we pray regularly as the fourth joyful mystery. And soon after this, they begin to feel the pinching of that sword. Because not long after his presentation is when King Herod sends his royal guard to go and to kill every boy, two years old and younger, in Bethlehem and the surrounding region. On Monday, we'll celebrate the Feast of the Holy Innocents of all those babies that were killed for Christ. But this caused the Holy Family to have to now flee to another country. The Holy Family became refugees into Egypt. The angel woke Joseph in the middle of the night and told him, take the mother and his child and flee to Egypt. The suffering of having to leave one's homeland to travel with a newborn infant to a foreign country. And there they remained, not for a few weeks, not for a few months, not for a year, but for seven years. Jesus grows up for his first seven years in Egypt. When he comes back from Egypt, he's basically the age of a first grader. That's how long they spent in Egypt. And having to live in a foreign land, in a foreign country, knowing that back home your child is being hunted. But also the suffering and knowing that all those children, all those boys in in Bethlehem and the surrounding region, all killed for Christ. I oftentimes think of the prophecy of Jeremiah, of Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they were no more. How Our Lady must have been the one weeping for those children because they were no more. All of them died for her son, and she was told that one day her son would die for all humanity. Those seven years in Egypt were followed by a return home And they were going to go back to Bethlehem until they were warned again in a dream by an angel. And they go to Nazareth. And there Joseph goes to Nazareth in hiding because they were afraid of the new king, Herod's son. And so once again, the Holy Family now enters into a nice quiet life in Nazareth. But there's still that warning, there's still that shadow over the cross. And they live life like everybody else. It wasn't like, you know, Joseph didn't have to go to work as if Jesus was just multiplying bread and fish every day. Like, what's what's for perfects today, Jesus? Well, let me see what I can whip up. (laughs) You know, like he wasn't creating meals. He lived like the rest of us. And Joseph did normal work like everyone else. Every day, Our Lady would go to the well like every other woman would go to the well to get the jar of water to bring the home in order to do the cooking, whatever needed to be done. And as our Lord grew, our Lord lived a regular life. Family, breakfast with the family, lunch with the family, dinner with the family, being told when to get up, when to go to bed. Some people often say, poor St. Joseph, what it must have been like to have breakfast every morning with the Immaculate Conception and the Incarnation. You know, no wonder why we have no words from Joseph in Scripture. What do you say? (laughs) You know, what do you have to add to the conversation, you know? How do you say to your son? So you think you know it all? Yeah, that's right, you do. (laughs) You know? But Jesus enters into that normal everyday life like us. He even allows himself to be taught how to work with wood. And he's known as the carpenter's son. When he comes back to Nazareth, people say, oh, isn't this Jesus, the carpenter's son? He's known as the carpenter's son. He lives everyday life like the rest. Now there is an incident when he's 12 years old that we know about when they went to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice as would be the normal custom every year. And when they're coming back, Jesus is 12 years old, so he's still at that age where he could have been walking with the women or he could have been walking with the men. And so Joseph thinks he's with Mary. Mary thinks he's with Joseph. You ever had that? 
come up in your family? Like, who's got them? Who's got the kid? <laughs> right? I see a lot of nudging going on out there. <laughs> it's good. Right? This is, who's got the kid, right? And so Mary thinks he's with Joseph. Joseph thinks he's with Mary. Meanwhile, he's back in Jerusalem. They travel a whole day before they realize he's missing. And then they travel a whole day back and spend another whole day looking for him. After three days, they finally find him. And he's teaching in the temple, asking questions of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Levites. And Mary says, why have you done this to us? Your father and I were looking for you everywhere. And I like that line because she says, not Joseph and I, but your father and I. He may have been the eternal son of God, but he lived his life on this earth as the son of Joseph. And he was known as Joseph's son. And Jesus kind of gives us really, you know, quick response of why were you looking for me everywhere? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? I always jokingly say Joseph must have been like, get in a car. (laughs) You know what kind of response? You're like, what kind of response is that? Why are we looking for me? Why were we looking for you everywhere? You were missing for three days. He would have been an amber alert. You know, he would have been on milk cartons at this point. Three days missing. You know, the pain and the anguish again, the shadow of the cross. But yet, Jesus is obedient to them. What is the normal family life they lived? The three things that they had that were so essential to living life in the midst of this world, in the midst of the sufferings that they had to go through. Faith, first and foremost. It had to have the great faith that they knew that if they went to Egypt, faith that the scripture would be fulfilled, the one that says, out of Egypt I have called my son. They had to have that great hope and trusting in God's promise that God will fulfill his promise. That this child will be not only the fall of many, but the rise of many in Israel. The promise that this child will bring hope to the world, restore it to the world, and bring the world life again. But ultimately, the heart of the Holy Family was the third, the gift of love. There was the true love of God in the Holy Family because the center of the family was God himself. Faith, hope, and love is what allowed the Holy Family to persevere through all the sufferings and struggles they had to go through. And the center of their family life was Christ. Easy when he's your son, right? (laughs) Everything Mary and Joseph did was for Christ. Why they got up in the morning, why they went to bed at night, why Joseph went to work, why Our Lady cleaned out, everything they did was focused on Christ. I share this today and I just ask us to think about our own families, perhaps the struggles and difficulties that we have to go through. And to know that Our Lady, St. Joseph, and Christ Jesus understand the struggles of daily life. They understand the struggles and difficulties of suffering. Even Jesus had to endure the loss of Joseph at such a young age of 30 years old when he lost his father Joseph. People asked if Jesus cried when Joseph died. If he cried and wept when Lazarus died, his friend, I could just imagine what it must have been like when he lost Joseph, the man he loved so much, the man who loved him so much. But to look at our lives and to think about how we can put Christ at the center of our own lives, how we can make each day and each moment of our lives a true act of love for Christ, to aliven with our, within our hearts true hope in our families, especially during this time of pandemic when it's hard to see our families, to have that hope that God will see us through this, that this pandemic will come to an end, to keep hope alive and not give in to despair and depression and sadness, which is so easy to do during these days. To have the family focus itself on true faith, true belief in God, and ultimately, to make the home a place of true love. So today, as we celebrate this feast of the Holy Family, may God grant us those beautiful gifts of faith, hope, and love that our families may become as sacred as the Holy Family was. It was not a family that was foreign to suffering and difficulties and struggles. And so with our own families too, we have our struggles and difficulties, and we have our crosses to bear. 
but with the gifts of faith, hope, and love, our families as well can be holy places where Christ is centered. May God bless you. And Merry Christmas.